In the last few lectures we studied precipitation reactions and diagnostic techniques based on these reactions. There we saw that, when soluble antigens are aggregated by antibodies, they form immune complexes. When these immune complexes become large enough to settle out of solution, they become visible. Now there are particulate antigens too. Particulate antigens are particles such as cells that carry antigenic molecules on their surface. For example, whole bacterial cells, fungal cells and mammalian cells. When specific antibodies to these particulate antigens are added, cross-linking occurs. This cross-linking results in clumping or agglutination of the particulate antigens. This clumping is visible enough to be seen by unaided eye. The difference between agglutination and precipitation reactions is that precipitation involves the aggregation of soluble antigen molecules. Whereas, agglutination involves the clumping of insoluble or particulate antigens. Like precipitation reactions, agglutination also occurs when antigens and antibodies are in equivalent proportions. Agglutination reaction is defined as an antigen antibody reaction in which antibodies cross link particulate antigens, resulting in the visible clumping of particles. In diagnostic immunology agglutination reactions have a wide variety of applications. It used for the detection of both antigens and antibodies in serum and other body fluids. Most importantly, agglutination tests are performed routinely by blood banks to determine A, B, O and R, H blood types in preparation for transfusions. In this video lecture, we will have an overview of types of agglutination reactions in diagnostic immunology and their applications. Agglutination reactions are of two types, active agglutination and passive agglutination. This classification is based on whether the antigenic determinants or epitopes to which antibodies will bind are present naturally on the target cells or not. Let's get into the details. Active agglutination. In active agglutination, the epitopes of interest are naturally found on a test particle. For example, antigens present on RBCs, antigens and antigenic determinants present on bacterial cells, fungal cells, etc. Antibodies can bind directly to these antigens and agglutinate them. Let's say we have a pure bacterial culture. We will put a suspension of this bacterial culture on a glass slide. Next, we will add antiserum containing specific antibodies to this bacteria. Clumping as well as clearing of the suspension indicates that agglutination has occurred and test is positive. These types of bacterial agglutination tests are done routinely for the identification of bacterial isolates from clinical specimen. Active agglutination tests are also used for blood grouping and cross-matching before blood transfusion. Other examples of application of active agglutination in diagnostic immunology are Weidel or Vidal test for diagnosis of typhoid fever, Brucella agglutination test for brucellosis, and Wild Felix test for rickettsiasis. Let's now understand what do we mean by passive agglutination. In passive agglutination, the epitope of interest does not occur naturally on the cells or particles to be agglutinated. In such cases, the epitopes or soluble antigens are chemically fixed on carrier particles. Few examples of carrier particles used in passive agglutination are latex, polystyrene, bentonite. Earlier RBCs were used for passive agglutination. But, 
synthetic carrier particles provide advantage of uniformity, stability and consistency, hence they are preferred now. Advantage of passive agglutination is that we can easily perform agglutination and interpret results in cases where pathogens culture is not feasible or only soluble antigens are available. For example in viral diseases. Let's say, these are the carrier particles for example latex beads. The antigens of interest such as soluble antigens are chemically fixed to them. Once carrier particles are coated with antigens of interest, the antibodies specific to these antigens are added. These antibodies react with the antigens and particles agglutinate with one another. We can also detect antigens by passive agglutination. This is done by reversing the process. That is instead of coating carrier particles with antigens, they are coated with antibodies. This method is known as reverse passive agglutination. Passive agglutination techniques are used for diagnosing various bacterial and viral diseases. One example is latex agglutination test for rubella antibody testing.